Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. The British Attorney General Dominic Grieve has ruled that letters written by Prince Charles to ministers in the last Labour government will not be published. The Guardian newspaper put in a freedom of information request for the release of 27 letters where Prince Charles was lobbying politicians. The High Court ruled that there was a public interest in their release, but the Attorney General vetoed this, saying they were particularly frank and would potentially have undermined his position of political neutrality if published. The case raises criticism over the freedom of the press, the neutrality of the royal family. To discuss this, I'm joined by Thomas Maysarcher Mills, chairman of the British Monarchist Society. Also here in the studio is Richard Fitzwilliams, who's a royal commentator, and Rob Booth, a journalist for The Guardian newspaper, which sought to publish the letters. Thank you very much for joining me here. Uh, Richard Fitzwilliams, do we want an heir to the throne with views? Well... We have to look at what precisely we want an heir to the throne to do. We have an unwritten constitution. Like Prince Albert, who was, after all, Queen Victoria's consort, the Prince of Wales has had to create his own role. That means that Alan Bennett's uh, quip in his play, The Madness of George III, that being Prince of Wales is not a position but a predicament, has a certain aptness, I think, because... If he were to just do the ceremonial duties, he would be criticised as being pretty useless if that's all that he did. Then, of course, there is his charitable work. Now, this is very significant, and this is one of the reasons that the Prince's views have particular weight. He's got 16 core charities. The Prince's Trust has helped over 600,000 disadvantaged people. As a result, given the fact he has extremely strong views, he bombards ministers with his views on a whole variety of subjects. The important thing is he must not, under any circumstances, be party political. I think that he makes a very valuable contribution, albeit a very controversial one very often, but it's absolutely essential to understand that there is no constitutional bar to him doing what he's doing. Rob Booth from The Guardian, your newspaper, has been seeking for several years to get these letters released. Given the charity work that he does, he has a vested interest in the young people of this country. The fact that he has strong views is no real surprise to us, is it? He is entitled to those views and he's entitled to express them. He is. He's, um, he's entitled to express them. Uh, the question really that we've been trying to probe is uh, the way in which he's expressing them in particular with uh, people in power, those in government, uh, ministers over the years, um, whether Labour or Conservative and now the Liberal Democrats. And what we're really seeking is some transparency around the nature of his um, involvement rather than questioning the nature of his views. I mean, they are, as Richard says, controversial in some areas. For example, you know, he's, uh, he's pushed very hard on complementary medicine. He's pushed very hard against uh, GM food, which is equally controversial given the, the view of some uh, demographers that we need to have this kind of uh, uh, technology to ensure Sure that the world's not hungry so there's planning architecture there's plenty of places where his, his views are controversial and are disputed um, and that makes it doubly important i think that there is clear um transparency around the way in which he's um seeking to push those views forward uh, with government ministers but with regard to these 27 letters it does sound like the tip of the iceberg presumably there's a there's a whole lot more uh, is there the expectation at the guardian newspaper that these are real bombshell revelations? Well, I think there's two things there. One is the um, what we already know about um, his interests. He's been uh, getting involved in politics since the late 1960s. I mean, he first of all, um, with Harold Wilson here, entered into letter correspondence about you know, Atlantic salmon fishing, and Harold Wilson reacted, the Prime Minister at that time of Great Britain, um, and, and changed things for him. And we know uh, that he's been, um, he's involved in a whole range of areas in terms of uh, uh, speaking to ministers, lobbying ministers and so on. But I would mention you, you mentioned involved in politics. It's very important. Of course, the 27 letters at issue, I understand, concern seven departments, departments of state. So he has views on political issues. What is so absolutely pivotal, though, is that he must avoid party politics. I would emphasise that. There was a case, of course, of his letters, uh, where his views on uh, the handover of uh, Hong Kong and uh, the Chinese leaders as being uh, uh, old waxworks. These, uh, letter, these views were 
in diaries and these diaries were illegally copied and they were syndicated. This was embarrassing but nonetheless it shouldn't have happened. Can I bring in Thomas Mace mills from the British Monarchist Society? So the a lot of criticism levelled at Prince Charles is that he is meddling and he shouldn't be doing this. No, no. I, listening to my colleagues both here, I'm, I'm looking at something a little bit different with Prince Charles because the, the role of the Crown in the British society today is to advise and warn the government of the day. And Prince Charles is simply going on the role that he's created for himself, which is not outlined in a written constitution. Therefore, as a representative of the Queen, he will be the future king, but in saying that, what he is now doing is outlining his role without being partial to any party, but being partial to the nation. Tom, Tom Peck from the Independent Newspaper, you'd like to respond to that? Yes, the problem is, what you say, we have no idea if it's true. How, we, we can't see these letters. How do we, the, the Attorney General has said if the publication of these letters threatens to undermine his political neutrality. So we get the sense that he probably isn't politically neutral, but we're not allowed to know. That's not a defence of him. The letters that he's written are clearly way over the mark, and that's why we can't see them. But we don't know for sure that they're way over the mark. There's no real surprise, uh, Tom Peck. It's impossible for him to express views without them being political. Yes, but he should have the wisdom not to express them, because as soon as he does express them, he becomes an enemy to democracy in this country, of which he is a profound one. But how would you say that the prince is an enemy to democracy? I mean, let's look at the speech, for example, for a second, if we may. Uh, the Attorney General's speech was certainly very surprising in its language uh, because he implied that if the contents of these letters were known, it would have an effect on the possibility, obviously, the probability one day of him becoming king. Now, it's very extraordinary to put the bar that high, yet say we cannot see the letters. I haven't obviously seen the letters. My interpretation of them, based on what we know that the Prince has done before, is that he's been extremely critical of government policy and writing in his opinion. But remember, these are just opinions. They're not opinions that are in any way instructions. And it's important under our Constitution for example, the Queen and her Prime Ministers, the weekly audience is naturally a confidential, the confidentiality between the Crown and the servants of the Crown, so to speak, is the way our Constitution tends to work. I was very surprised at the Attorney General's speech because I think it was a bad speech. I think that if you say you can't see letters but they're so dynamic, so much there's a positive dynamite in them, obviously people will want to see them. But I suspect that it was simply the Prince strongly disagreeing with the particular government departments and government policy. Should Prince Charles's letters be published? I'm discussing this with Thomas Mace Archer Mills, Richard Fitzwilliams, Robert Booth, and Tom Pack. There's an idea well, here that from the, Guardian. The, the, the opinions are just opinions and not instructions, which I think is a is a difficult one because of his his position is such uh, is of such influence and clearly of such influence that he's he do, his opinions don't stand on the same footing as ours. I mean, his influence is actually backed up as well by some constitutional powers that we didn't know very much about until recently, such as the the need to pass bills past Prince Charles where they affect his private interest through his ownership of the and a custodianship of the Duchy of Cornwall, the big estate. Well, have there been any, any instances where, where he has vetoed the passing of those, though? There's, it's, it's just a, presumably yeah. it's a rubber stamping uh, no, it's not, exercise. Not entirely. I mean, we know that there are particular issues on which he's been consulted um, on a whole range of bills, a dozen bills we calculated so far in the last uh, few years. The nature of what he said and what um, ministers asked of him, we don't know, because yet again, the government won't release that information. But you would expect, wouldn't you, him to be consulted on the Duchy of Cornwall? I mean, for example, the Duchy's income pays for the prince and his immediate family. Mm. They don't cost the taxpayer anything, and it wouldn't be surely sure. surprising. Now, my point is that this may underpin some greater influence. You know, the fact that he has this locus over, over, oh, over legislation mm. means that when he voices another opinion about fisheries or whatnot, then it has a little bit more power, potentially, because of that. The problem is we don't really know how all of this operates, and that's what we want to find out. We want to know how it operates, and that's why we need to see much more uh, clearly 
really what's going on. The Attorney General's uh, point, coming back to Richard, uh, you know, Richard says it's a, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a very clear, or was a, uh, not a very good opinion. I think the problem the Attorney General has was that he was looking at something of a constitutional crisis here, in insofar as the need to release these letters as the information tribunal demanded would have put it's the attorney general seems to say his kingship in doubt yes this is why it was an absolutely extraordinary speech it also could have been just a bad political speech by a politician who happens to be a bit of an idiot uh, because i have to say <laughs> reading the speech it's a possibility i mean it is a possibility because i'm looking for example at ministers bombarded by his black spider with reference to his handwriting memos now this is the daily telegraph of 2006 and there are a whole variety here of examples where we've got the prince looking at education in fact, had an interesting clash with the former Labour Education Secretary, Charles Clark, who thought the Prince's views were extremely unhelpful and said so public. We'd, we'd also broke a convention or two, whether it was hunting, whether it was the foot and mouth disease and also architecture. But the point, as I see it, is... The prince has overall this humanist philosophy. He's done a tremendous amount for society. It's because he is who he is that he has the influence that you mention. But it's because he's behaved over the years in the way he has that, as I see it, his views are valued, but they are only opinions. Indeed, Thomas May Sarcher Mills, Richard was referring to some of his opinions on the environment and whatnot, and in fact he, he criticised, well, he reportedly wrote to Tony Blair uh, when he was Prime Minister, criticising the government for, for destroying the countryside, failing to tackle rural poverty and housing. Um, he's also commented on things like uh, uh, architecture, but these kinds of things, uh, maybe the Prince actually doesn't mind uh, being in the public domain. What, what yes. do you make of that? Well, well the point is Prince Charles is not king yet. He is simply the heir to the throne, and we have to look at how all of our sovereigns have acted when they were in a position of heir to the throne. Her Majesty learned from King George VI. Uh, we have to look and see what she thought then. But when we talk about well, she, she Prince was, Charles... She was in her early 20s, though. She was, so she didn't have much time to actually mould herself into a position. She had a very small amount of time to transition from a girl in sense to a woman who became queen, whereas Prince Charles, here he is. He's been Prince of Wales for, oh my gosh, <laughs> we're talking well over 50 years. He's 60... Or 64 very now. Soon. No, no, yes. no, 64 next month. Next month, I okay. Um, I mean, as for writing letters to the government, I've written letters to the government, I've written letters to Tony Blair. There were things I was not happy about. There's plenty of but I things. Think that you have Tony Blair's ear in the way that the Prince of Wales does. I mean, no, I no, I don't. But the Prince of Wales granted his position. We need to look at his track record, and that's what this is all about. Well, I think we're his... trying to look at his track record. We're not allowed. We have not been. We allowed are. To we are the allowed General. to look at exactly what he has done over his interim as the Prince of Wales. All the good that he has done, we need to look at the Duchy of Cornwall, we need to look at the people he protects, we need to look at the interests that aren't just his, but belong to everyone who lives on that estate. Everything that is directly related to what's derived from the business and the networking that goes on in that estate, not only for his constituents, well, he doesn't have constituents, he has no, he renters, He's not elected. I don't but... Know we, we really need to look here at what's going on. There's always been a stigma since the Diana years around Prince Charles. And I see that um, what is going on in relevance to that is still being carried through to the current day. I think what we really need to look at is the influence that he has, which The Guardian is trying to... Um, through FOI say, okay, we want everything brought out into the light. Well, okay, that's fine, we understand that, we accept that, but why are we... Do you accept it? I mean, for example, this surely is the crux of the matter. Uh, should the Prince of Wales have a different sort of role? I mean, should these letters be seen? You are quite happy, from what you say, for this correspondence to be seen. It seems to me that the workings of the Crown and the ministers, the way it's been handled in the past is that these, and they will under the new uh, Freedom of Information Act changes, remain totally private. That's the Queen and the heir to the throne and the second in line to the throne. Yes, yes, and I, I see that. Uh, I, I could go pretty much in the direction 
with my colleague here from The Guardian and say, look, in order to see exactly what's going on, publish the letters publish them. On the other side, I can say, well, we need to look and see exactly how government works. No other government is going to take letters from their head of state or the person coming head of state and say, all right, this is what we think. Just put it out there for anyone. I would like to see a crown that is a little more transparent. Yes, that way we can dispel any sorts of rumours as to the way things are going. By the, with by the crown being more transparent, you're talking about the head of head of state. I mean, surely it would be completely wrong for, say, the a prime minister to uh, reveal what was said in a private audience to the Queen. Indeed, well, saying every meeting yes. anything that had been said. Indeed, I'll, actually, I'll turn to Tom Pickra from the newspaper, The Independent. That is true. We, we know that the Queen has private audiences with Prime Ministers and has done for the last five decades. The contents or whatever is discussed in those private meetings is never made public. This isn't any different, yeah. is it? Well, that is another reason why the monarchy are a great international embarrassment to our country and we should get rid of them. No, but that's no, an but outrageous view. It's not even tactfully expressed that uh, most people, both here and internationally, would take a very different view to the Okay, Tom Pick, can I, can I take another tack then? Um, we've talked about the influence of, the, of Prince Charles over policy, but really how much influence does he have? I mean, has there ever been a government policy that's been changed because of what Prince Charles thinks? There's actually well, no proof of that, is there? No, there's no proof because they won't let us see the letters because Prince Charles is seeking to interfere in government policy. Dominic Grieve, I, I, I do take issue with um, what um, one of the panellists said about Dominic Grieve is possibly not a very intelligent man and he's and is expressed his opinion in such a way. I think Dominic Grieve's letter shows that Prince Charles is perhaps not a very intelligent man, and he's warning him as strongly as he possibly can not to carry on seeking to interfere in the future. Well, if, if that was the if case, it's interesting that you should say that, because politicians can make speeches that are effective. They can also make speeches with a certain angle, which are extremely ineffective. And, and whatever, your views on whether, whatever your views on whether or not we should see these letters, to say you can't see them, but on the other hand, their contents could be dynamite, is a rather counterproductive speech. Oh, can I turn to Robert Booth from the Guardian newspaper. Has there been Tom, a, has, Tom, there, has there been a government policy that's been changed off the back of a recommendation? Well, Tom, well, uh, it was, um, <coughs> fortunately, there is some evidence that he has changed things. So, very helpfully during this uh, um, legal process, which we've been trying to get the uh, letters out of the government from Prince Charles, the um, Information Tribunal produced a chronology of all of Prince Charles's interventions from the beginning in 1969 with Harold Wilson up to the current day. And I was looking at this earlier, and one of them is uh, I think it's Charles's first recorded intervention where he talks about, um, uh, he writes to uh, uh, Harold Wilson and complains about the salmon stocks in the North Atlantic, which is, you know, uh, he's still interested in fish all these years later. But in it, um, he says that, that he's very concerned about that. And Harold Wins Wilson writes back to him in a, in a letter explaining that they have been, um, they've, they've been pressing for immediate action after uh, Charles wrote to ensure that damage is not done to the stocks, adding, if you would like any further action on this question, or if you would like the minister and his officials concerned to wait upon you to discuss the whole question in more detail, I should, of course, be happy to arrange this. He's been doing it and having reactions but, for 40 years. But you're, you're quoting that very effectively, may I say, to make the Prime Minister is really sounding obsequious in the way you quote it. In fact, it is just surely simply being polite. We don't know that he's had specific influence. We do know that he has the influence from someone who's the experience that he has, who's done what he's done with international networking, with the core charities. No one's disputing, or they shouldn't dispute, that that is absolutely amazing. He's but one this of the is, foremost this, entrepreneurs. But there are two different things here. You know, his charitable work and the, and, and the work through the organisations that he has, uh, which have charitable status, they're not necessarily conventional grant-giving charities, all these organisations. Some of them are more like think tanks. That is one thing. And that is, in fact, separate from the work that he does when he's communicating directly with the uh, with ministers. You can't you can't keep saying, well, you know, look, he does all these good things. It's a smokescreen. But also, people cite his charitable goodness. Uh, well, I, I do think things. that that his comment is uh, beneath taste. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing whether or not the Attorney General should have vetoed the release of letters by Prince Charles to government ministers with Thomas Mace Archer Mills, chairman of the British Monarchist Society, Richard Fitzwilliams, a royal commentator, Robert Booth, a reporter for the Guardian newspaper, and Tom Peck, a journalist for the independent newspaper.
Tom Peck, I'll turn to you again. Surely the checks and balance and balances are there. Uh, sh- legislation still has to go through Parliament. It still has to go through both houses. Um, there's enough checks and balances there. To, to, to however obsequious, as the word's been used, uh, a prime minister is towards the towards the the prince or the future king. Um, there are certain checks and balances, yes, but it's an un, it is an uncodified constitution, as we know. So the prince of Wales, in this case, has got 40 years to try and carve out a role for himself and he's decided to take on various issues and in those issues we suspect he has been overstepping the mark seeking to influence government policy that is what that that is what the judges at this tribunal effectively decided by saying there was an overwhelming public interest in their publication and then this has been overturned so has he overstepped his mark are the checks and balances fair we don't know because if we he'd cannot just see done, the letters if he'd just done the ceremonial constitutional work that might be expected of someone who didn't have his energy or his particular interest wouldn't you say that that was a waste that's true tom peck you'd be you'd be more critical of prince charles if he did nothing no i definitely wouldn't if he wants to do nothing and waste a little bit of taxpayers money that's Inv- not very even good. the environment and into religious understanding are nothing to you no I said if he wanted to do nothing... But these, are, a, these are two causes, serious causes, that he was among the first to champion. Yes. Well, that's all very well, but I'm one of these old-fashioned people who believes in democracy and thinks he, should have, he has no place trying to influence public life. At all? Yes. In other words, basically, being a Prince of Wales is, in your view, just simply a cipher. He'd open a hospital, uh, he'd uh, inspect a regiment, that's that. Well, if it was up to me, I'd get rid of him. But, well, I got um, that but, fact. But, I think but, we all but, have. But, but, uh, but, but, but so but, we're but, going but to get failing, rid. Failing that, um, yes, he should continue to be a cipher like his mother. Can I just turn to Thomas May Sacha Mills uh, from the British Monarchist Society? Is there any kind of gar- what, what do you think? Do you think um, when he becomes king, he will segue into this kind of uh, the same kind of figure that he is as prince, or do you think that he will become less outspoken? Perhaps it's hardly likely that he's going to act like his namesake Charles the no, First. No, 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 not at all. Is he? No, I, he'll be George the Seventh, of course. But um, looking at the way things are right now and this discussion we're having, we need to really look at what is going on here. This this gentleman Tom wants to get rid of a man who has championed phenomenal causes, who is trying to keep a kingdom that he's going to inherit the best way that he knows how. We're talking about a politician here who wants to go ahead and say, okay, well, we don't want to release papers, the judge wants to release papers, doesn't want to release papers. We need to really sit here and, and have this conversation right now. It's Why? embarrassing to live in a kingdom that someone's going to inherit by circumstance of their birth. It's embarrassing. It's Why embarrassing. Why the vast number I, of British people want it? Every single poll, the Republicans support it. Something oh no, right. But if there is, gentlemen, if there is such public interest in these letters, why is it public interest? It's because Prince Charles is who he is and the crown is what it is it's to this nation. Okay, okay, notwithstanding arguments about whether or not there should be a monarchy, um, uh, Thomas, I would like to get your view on whether the views that um, Prince Charles expresses, are they the views that it's fit for a king to express? I, I, will there be a cha- Will he be as outspoken if he? I don't think when, he will. He takes, he I don't think he will be as outspoken. I think we will see um, really him take on the Tuesday meetings with the prime minister and and um, other ministers in that sort of a role like like the current queen does. However, I do feel that um, he will continue to have a great mouthpiece, really, if you will, on well, things no, that I'm really sure, affect. But surely it's absolutely essential under our constitution that when the prince is king, all this lobbying naturally has to cease. I, it I mean, it's essential. It does. But of the course way it he is. is now, uh, unless we actually want to say Prince Charles is doing something unconstitutional, which I believe fully he is not, that's where we would bring in the constitution. When he ascends to the throne, he is not going to be totally just out there in saying well, things. I think, it, I think it's, it's, I think it's to probably too late for him already, actually. And I think this is something the Attorney General almost says in his judgment, in that you know, there's no way that any member of the British population is going to believe that he's a neutral king on a number of matters, when he, if and when he becomes king, because of the years of uh, lobbying that have gone before. His neutrality is already impeached, if you like. And I think there's a... Looking forward, there's a sort of broad 
broader issue here about our understanding of the role of the monarchy and our clarity, our clarity as a nation about understanding the role of the monarchy. Its active role and how that sits within our life is not clear. And for Prince William going forward, there's going to be a, a similar predicament for him and how he engages in life and public life. And it would be much better if we could start the process now of clearing this up by letting these letters be seen and then moving on from there with a new understanding and a new kind of deal, really. The, what a great Victorian constitutional expert, Walter Badgett, uh, said, don't look day let daylight in on magic. But of course, we are in a different era. My own feeling is that the Prince of Wales knows perfectly well that when he becomes king, certain views of his, of course, are known as we've all been discussing. The Queen, it was totally different, and we had no idea what the Queen thinks about anything that is significant that has been made public. Except we knew that she uh, was very much against Abu Hamza. Abu well, Hamza, yes, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and that, that case. Yeah. And yet, yeah, but that, I mean, that, that actually shows that she's in touch with her people, doesn't right. it? Well, so yes, she, it's yes, actually yes, quite comforting to know that the Queen thinks that about uh, somebody who was wanted in terrorism about, charges. Yes, it was very interesting, however, that that should not even that should not have been made public and why, there was why an not? apology because the conversations with the monarch, because the monarch is and has his position of head of state and above politics, the conventions which I believe have served the country well are that such conversations should be silent. Okay, and but Richard Fitzwilliams, you talk, about, you talk about above politics, yeah. but actually Prince Charles has gone on record, I think, in Vanity Fair magazine saying that he did not intend to abide by the convention that he should stay out of politics. And uh, he was quoted Party as saying, politics. if his parents wanted him to rise above politics when he becomes king, that's their bad luck. So can uh, we take that as some kind no, of warning? No, no, or no, some no. Kind I, of I really think I wasn't aware of this quote, but it would be... It uh, was a few years ago, though. It was, it was maybe 10, 15 years ago. But there, should, should, we, should we take that as perhaps he, he could be... Maybe there is a different role that can be carved out for the king? Uh, no, I would emphatically say that his role will be very similar to that of the current queen's. Of course, I take your point that we know his personal views on a lot of matters, but that shouldn't uh, definitely will not alter the fact that as king he will maintain strict impartiality there won't be the form of lobbying we've got at the moment just as his charitable work perhaps William undoubtedly will take some of that on with the monarchy, in my opinion, we get this amazing bargain. Some of it is controversial, like the Prince on Architecture. No one would dispute that, let alone himself. But the sovereign has a particular position in our unwritten constitution. It simply won't and wouldn't be even possible for him to take a networking role, and officially anyway, when he becomes king. I just turn to, can I just turn quickly to Rob Booth from what's the next step for the Guardian newspaper? Are they going to pursue this? Um, maybe the next Attorney General won't, uh, won't veto it and you'll have a new, a new case. Well, what's, the, what's the next next step for your newspaper? Well, practically, it's, uh, it's a question of challenging uh, or considering challenging anyway this decision by the Attorney General uh, um, probably through a judicial review. So um, that's something we've been, uh, we've been looking at and, um, and we shall see where that gets us. It uh, it'll certainly take us to the High Court if that's the case. Well, gentlemen, we've run out of time, sadly. I'd just like to finish by thanking my guests, Robert Booth, reporter for The Guardian newspaper, Richard Fitzwilliams, who is a royal commentator, Thomas May Sarcher mills from the British Monarchist Society, and on the line, Tom Peck, a journalist for The Independent newspaper. Thank you for joining me, Brendan Cole.